Take your Bibles and turn with me to uh, the book of Isaiah, Isaiah chapter 49. And in our blue Bibles, this is page 1138. 1138 in our blue Bibles. And uh, I will read uh, the whole of verses 1 to 6. Just uh, six verses to begin with. So beginning at Isaiah chapter 49 and verse 1. <clears throat> Listen to me, you islands. Hear this, you distant nations. Before I was born, the Lord called me. From my birth, he has made mention of my name. He made my mouth like a sharpened sword. In the shadow of his hand, he hid me. He made me into a polished arrow and concealed me in his quiver. He said to me, You are my servant, Israel, in whom I will display my splendor. But I said, I have labored to no purpose. I have spent my strength in vain and for nothing. Yet what is due me is in the Lord's hand, and my reward is with my God. And now the Lord says, he who formed me in the womb to be his servant, to bring Jacob back to him and gather Israel to himself, 
For I am honored in the eyes of the Lord, and my God has been my strength. He says, It is too small a thing for you to be my servant to restore the tribes of Jacob and bring back those of Israel I have kept. I will also make you a light for the Gentiles, that you may bring my salvation to the ends of of the earth. Father God, we thank you for this prophecy, this word from you through uh, your servant uh, Isaiah. And we thank you that uh, even though it was uh, spoken uh, 700 and some years before Jesus came into the world, it was spoken truly and it was spoken with the revelation about your son and that he fulfilled it so wonderfully and so amazingly by his coming into the world. And we thank you for this assurance of Scripture, and I pray that as we recall it and we recall how your Son has fulfilled it, that we will strengthen and encourage our faith in our Savior Christ Jesus. And so I pray in his matchless name. Amen. <clears throat> One of the most important and persuasive reasons for believing Jesus of Nazareth is the true Savior of the world is his fulfillment of the scriptural prophecies about the Messiah. For Jewish people especially, who have long revered the Hebrew scriptures or the Old Testament, as the written word of God, their confirmation is quite necessary for belief. The book of Isaiah has several prophecies about the Mashiach, or in English, the Anointed One. And these include the chapter 7 prediction about a virgin bearing a child called Emmanuel, the chapter 9 prophecy about a son of David who will be a ruler forever, and the chapter 11 word about the ruler and branch from Jesse. But later in the book of Isaiah comes another form of messianic prophecy and four different revelations about a mysterious servant and savior. The most famous of these is the chapter 53 prophecy about the suffering servant afflicted and put to death for the sins of others. But yet another important servant oracle is Isaiah chapter 49, verses 1 to 6. And this prophecy that the Savior of Israel will also become a light for the Gentiles and salvation for the whole world. Listen to me, you islands. Hear this, you distant nations. Isaiah begins in verse 1. So this prophecy is not for Israel only, but for peoples of the islands and coastlands of the Mediterranean Sea and the nations far beyond the boundaries of Judah. Before I was born, the Lord called me. From my birth, he has made mention of my name. With these words, Isaiah seems to speak about his own call and his appointment to be a prophet for Yahweh God. But from what Isaiah says further on, we understand that we can, he can hardly be speaking about himself and that he is prophesying instead about another child of Israel and one who will serve the Lord as none have done before. The speaker of these verses is the same heavenly chosen and favored servant whom Isaiah has spoken about in chapter 42, verses 1 to 4, and about whom God himself has declared, I will put my spirit on him, 
and he will bring justice to the nations. Here in chapter 49, verse 2 speaks further about the origin of the prophetic servant of Yahweh. He, or the Almighty Lord, made my mouth like a sharpened sword. In the shadow of his hand, he hid me. God himself has prepared the servant so that he will speak the truth of Yahweh powerfully and effectively. But for now, until the time for the revelation of the servant arrives, he remains hidden in the shadow of the hand of God and shrouded in his mysterious wisdom. He made me into a polished arrow and concealed me in his quiver. The servant says similarly about himself, because like a sharpened arrow hidden in the quiver of an archer, the Lord Almighty has ordained the servant, when the time is right, to become a minister of heavenly righteousness and judgment. He said to me, verse 3 declares next, you are my servant Israel, in whom I will display my splendor. And so here it seems the servant is the whole nation of Israel. But from verse 5 below, we learn that God has appointed the servant to become a minister to the people who descend from Jacob, or Israel. And so we understand that the chosen one must really be an individual or single person from within the nation. The servant is a true and righteous son of Israel. And Yahweh Almighty has called him by the name of the whole nation because the servant will serve as a perfect image or true representation of what God has ordained all his people should be. Just as the Lord God has displayed his splendor or brought glory to himself through Israel and through the work of redemption he has accomplished for his people, God will glorify himself through the truest son of Israel. And the Almighty will display his splendor more fully and completely for his own people and for all the nations of the world through the chosen servant. But despite the heavenly glory that will be manifested through the servant, in verse 4, he laments about himself, but I have said, I have labored to no purpose. I have spent my strength in vain and for nothing. How can this be? That the chosen servant of Yahweh will labor and serve, but seem to accomplish nothing. Will God really allow him to suffer such disappointment? In chapters 50 and 53, and the later songs about the servant, we receive the surprising revelation that he will endure rejection, humiliation, and even deadly violence, and that he will be despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and familiar with suffering. So yes, for a while the Lord will allow the servant to bear a burden of disappointment and sorrow. But as he also testifies here in chapter 49 and verse 3, yet what is due me is in the Lord's hand, and my reward is with my God. Only for a while will the servant seem to accomplish nothing. Only for a season will he labor vainly, because Yahweh will surely grant the service servant what he deserves and will certainly reward him the just wages of his toil. And now, the Lord says, the prophetic servant declares about Yahweh God in verse 5, He who formed me in the womb to be his servant, 
to bring back Jacob to him and gather Israel to himself. The righteous servant begins to say what his master, the Lord God, has newly announced about him and what the servant will finally become. But before he reveals what God has said, the true son of Israel pauses to recall the service Almighty Yahweh has first appointed the servant to perform for his own chosen people. Although the descendants of Jacob have departed from the way of obedience to the Lord, the righteous servant will turn them back. And although the people of Israel have faithlessly wandered from their God, the true son will gather them back in faithfulness and devotion. For I am honored in the eyes of the Lord, and my God has been my strength, the servant says further, because he recognizes what a high calling it is for him to serve the chosen people of God and understands the Lord has strengthened the servant for this work. Then, in verse 6, he returns to the revelation from Yahweh about the servant and his mission. It is too small a thing for you to be my servant, to restore the tribes of Jacob and bring back those of Israel I have kept. As great and worthy as the mission is of raising up the people of Jacob and restoring the remnant the Lord has preserved for himself, this service is too small, slight, or trifling for the righteous servant and true son of Israel. The Almighty has appointed him for an even greater ministry. I will also make you a light for the Gentiles. God now tells his chosen servant that you may bring my salvation to the ends of the earth, or more literally, that you may become my salvation to the ends of the earth. And here, here the Hebrew word salvation is Yeshua. Jesus, or Jesus. With these words, then, the heavenly I Am makes the profound announcement that the mission of his righteous servant will reach far beyond Israel and the restoration of the chosen nation to include the nations of the whole world and the salvation of humankind. What a marvelous plan God has conceived. What a great calling he has given to the true and righteous son of Israel. What a faithful servant he must be. And what a wondrous savior the chosen one will become. Excuse me. Who is this great Savior the prophet Isaiah has foreseen? Who is this obedient servant of the Almighty Yahweh? Many have faithfully served the Lord God, but none have been the servant and the Savior that our own Christ Jesus has become. The Gospel of Luke records that shortly after his birth, when his parents Joseph and Mary took the infant Jesus to the temple in Jerusalem to consecrate him to the Lord according to the Mosaic law of the firstborn, the aged Simeon took Jesus in his arms and announced, in the words of Isaiah 49, that he is the foretold Savior. Sovereign Lord, Simeon said, as you have promised, you now dismiss your servant in peace. For my eyes have seen your salvation, your Yeshua, which you have prepared in the sight of all people, 
a light for revelation to the Gentiles and for glory to your people, Israel. The righteous and devout Simeon, who had long been waiting for the consolation of Israel, received a revelation from the Holy Spirit that the baby Jesus and son of Joseph and Mary was the servant and savior the prophet Isaiah had foretold should come. And so we understand Jesus is the true fulfillment of the prophecy. Listen to me, you islands. Hear this, you distant nations. The servant of the Lord God has said long ago through the prophet, Before I was born, the Lord called me. From my birth, he has made mention of my name. And thinking about the heavenly Son of God and his everlasting life with the Almighty Father, these words take on a marvelous meaning. In the beginning was the Word. John 1, 1 says about Christ Jesus, And the Word was with God, and the Word was God. So indeed, long before Jesus was in the womb of Mary, he was called by God. And before his human conception, God the Father had forever spoken the name of his immortal Son. He made my mouth like a sharpened sword, the servant has also said about himself in the words of Isaiah. In the shadow of his hand he hid me, he made me into a polished arrow and concealed me in his quiver. And for centuries after the prophet wrote these words, the servant did remain hidden in the shadowy hand of God and the quiver of his almighty purpose. But when the fullness of time had come, as Paul writes in Galatians 4.4, 4, God sent his son born of a woman. And so the Almighty has drawn and revealed the sharpened sword of his all-powerful living word. And the heavenly warrior has taken from his quiver the well-honed arrow of his swift and sure judgment. And someday, in the hidden wisdom of God, the sharpened sword and the polished arrow will return in heavenly power and glory and will punish the wicked of the world and strike down the ungodly nations as Revelation 19, 14 perceives by his own almighty word, which comes out of his mouth like a sharp sword. You are my servant Israel, in whom I will display my splendor. The Lord God has said through Isaiah to the true and righteous offspring of the chosen nation. And about the son of Israel, born to Joseph and Mary, John 1.14 says, The word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory. The glory of the one and only, who came from the Father full of grace and truth. Through Christ Jesus, then, God surely has displayed his majestic splendor. Speaking prophetically through Isaiah, the servant has also said about himself, I have labored to no purpose. I have spent my strength in vain and for nothing. And with these words, the immortal Savior has lamented over what his own people would do to him, how they would deny and reject him, and that they would even crucify the Lord of glory himself. Yet what is due me is in the Lord's hand. The servant has also prophesied about himself in Isaiah, and my reward is with my God. And the just reward the servant has received for his suffering and crucifixion has been his marvelous resurrection from the dead. 
The hand of the ever-living I am has duly and rightly raised Christ Jesus from the grave. And as Romans 1.4 says, declared him with power to be the Son of God. And now, the Lord says, in the words of the heavenly Son of God, speaking through the prophet Isaiah, He who formed me in the womb to be his servant, to bring back Jacob to him, and gather Israel to himself. In fulfillment of these prophetic words, Christ Jesus was conceived and born a son of Israel. He lived the life of a faithful Jew and ministered first to his own people. And he called all his early disciples from his fellow Israelites. In Matthew 15, 24, Jesus even says about himself, I was sent only to the lost sheep of Israel. The Savior never refused ministry to the Syrian woman begging deliverance for her possessed daughter or to the Roman centurion asking healing for his servant. But Jesus well understood his calling first to Israel and his own Jewish people. And he fulfilled this holy obligation as an honor from the Heavenly Father as the servant had spoken about it beforehand in Isaiah, for I am honored in the eyes of the Lord, and my God has been my strength. But happily, for you and me, Gentiles, and for everyone born outside the household of Israel, it has always been the will and pleasure of the Almighty Father to include us in the salvation the servant has brought into the world. Through Isaiah, the Lord God himself has said to his heavenly son, it is too small a thing for you to be my servant to restore the tribes of Jacob and bring back those of Israel I have kept. Even this great and worthy work will not be enough for the immortal servant. I will also make you a light for the Gentiles, that you may bring salvation to the ends of the earth. The ends of the earth. For the Gentiles and those outside Israel. The heavenly servant will become Yeshua, Jesus, Jesus, or salvation for Gentiles as well as for Jews. And what has Christ Jesus done? What has God the Father brought into the world through his immortal Son? Salvation for the Jews first, and then also for Gentiles to fulfill the servant prophecy of Isaiah. And so also the apostles of Christ have preached the gospel of his salvation, first to the Jews, and then also to the Gentiles. As the apostle Paul explains in Acts 13, 47, from the prophetic words of Isaiah 49, 6, for this is what the Lord has commanded us, Paul said. I have made you a light for the Gentiles, that you may bring salvation to the ends of the earth. How wonderful that Isaiah foresaw our salvation so long ago. How amazing that the servant of Israel should also become the savior for all men and women. And how marvelous and gracious that God has decided to save you and me along with his chosen people.
the revelation light of Christ Jesus for Gentiles like you and me in fulfillment of the prophecy of Isaiah is the reason we celebrate Christmas on December 25th. When the early fathers of the church were debating about the best date for celebrating the birth of Christ, they could find no clear indication from Scripture about the occasion. So they finally settled on the winter solstice, which occurs this Tuesday, when the sun begins to shine for longer hours and the occasion for many idolatrous pagan festivals at that time. On December 25th, the Romans had long celebrated the birth of the unconquered sun, the celestial sun of the sky above, that is. And the Persians similarly observed the birthday of the so-called sun of righteousness in reverence to the sun of the sky. To turn pagan con converts from the worship of the sun and the many indecencies of the old festivals, the church fathers chose to baptize the Roman and Persian holiday, so to speak, and transform it into a day of Christian celebration. And their decision proved to be remarkably wise and enlightening for the world. As one early theologian explained about Christmas, we hold this day holy, not like the pagans because of the birth of the sun, but because of him who made it. Christmas celebrates the immortal word of God who spoke the heavens and earth into being becoming the child Jesus. And Christmas recalls the birth of the servant of Israel, who has become a light for all nations and salvation for every believing man and woman. Praise the Lord. Let's pray. Father God, we do thank you for your salvation. We thank you for Yeshua, Jesus, Jesus. We thank you that you have sent him into the world in fulfillment of your many promises and prophecies. We thank you that uh, he has come into the world to save his own people, the Jewish people, but that you did not just limit it to them, Father God, but that you included us in your glorious plan of salvation. And through Christ Jesus, the light of revelation has shone into the whole world, and it has even revealed itself to us, Father God. We thank you that you have, uh, Lord, revealed the good gospel to each one of us, and that through believing in Christ Jesus, your Holy Spirit has come into our hearts and our minds and filled us with the presence of our Lord and Savior. Father God, we thank you for this wonderful salvation that we celebrate at this time of year, that at this solstice time and at this the darkest time, but also the beginning of the brightness. Father God, we thank you that you have sent your Son into the world, and he has brought light and salvation by his coming. And Father, we rejoice over this, we celebrate this, and I pray that your Spirit will fill our hearts with this assurance and with this happy hope, Lord, of the gospel. And so I pray in Jesus' name. Amen.
Jesus Christ be with you uh, throughout this week and uh, throughout this Christmas season that it be a blessed happy and uh, an encouraging Christmas for you amen <laughs>